let's get started. Uh, today it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mike Flanagan. Dr. Flanagan is a professor with the Department of Renewable Resources at the University of Alberta and is the director of the Western Partnership for Wildland Fire Science, which is located also at the University of Alberta. He received his B.S. C of Physics from the University of Manitoba, his M.S. in Atmospheric Sciences from Colorado State University, and his Ph.D. in Plant Sciences from Cambridge University. So he has been to many places of the world. International speaker, international topic, international audience. I love it. Um, Mike has also completed a meteorologist course with Environment Canada and worked for me as a meteorologist for a few years. And then after that, he worked as a physical scientist, research scientist, and senior research scientist with the Canadian Forest Service. And now, uh, Dr. Flanagan's primary research interests include fire, weather, climate interactions, including the potential impact of climate change, lightning ignited forest fires, landscape fire modeling, and interactions between vegetation, fire, and weather. Uh, he was also the editor in chief of the International Journal of Wildland Fire Science, or Wildland Fire, from 2002 to 2008 and has taken on leadership roles with the U.S. National Assessment on Global Change, IPCC, IG, BP, Fire Fast Track Initiative, and Global Change Terrestrial Ecosystems efforts on the global impacts of fire. And today he's going to be sharing with us what happened in the Fort McMurray fire up in Canada and discuss actions that we can take to prevent events like this in the future. Okay, this looks like you've had a very, uh, very interesting past, so I'm excited to hear what you have to say, and I will mute myself and turn the stage over to you, Dr. Flynn. Thanks, Stacey. Um, well, uh, hopefully you can see my PowerPoint, and that's the last slide, so I guess we're all done. So I guess you're going to I'm going to have to move through to the beginning here. Um, it's not the same as a, a regular PowerPoint. There we go. Um, first and foremost, thanks for joining. Uh, I know March Madness has started, and uh, I, I'm, it's a big draw, and I'm a big college basketball fan as well. Secondly, almost as importantly, is I'm just a spoke. spoke I'm going to read all the people who have been involved. Bill DeGroote, Dave Finn, Kevin Keith, Paul Kruger, Mark Newman. Hunger. And especially Cordy Teamstra, who without his efforts, this wouldn't have been possible. Um, so I said three things. You know, fire people love three things. We love our triangles and things like that. So the third thing is lessons from Fort McMurray, lessons learned. Um, you know, it's a bit presumptuous for me to say that. This is really about just a picture of what happened in Fort McMurray. And there is a review that's been ongoing, and the report, the review is supposed to be released any day now, and that will have a lot more detail. And this talk is much more on the physical or biophysical side, and I won't be going to the social sciences at all, okay? Just my background comfort zone. And you can see in that first slide, um, there's one major highway in and out of town. It was just recently made into four lanes, and all four lanes were used for egress north and south of the town. And without those four lanes, I really think there was a proper, there could have been a number of fatalities, especially when you only have a two-lane road. One road accident could block that ro that road and that egress. So let's talk about fire. And I'm going to talk about fire in Canada and then in Alberta because for some people it's not as familiar as California. Uh, briefly about fire management. Then we'll talk about Fort McMurray and you know, kind of what can we do? What's our options here? And that is not Fort McMurray in the slide, on the picture on the left. That is uh, Slave Lake, and uh, which was another community in Alberta, and the fire in 2011 burned one-third of the town. So this is kind of our, our second community that's been significantly impacted by wildland fire. So Canada, we get about 7,000 fires a year. That's a small number compared to the United States, 
we, but we burn about 3 million hectares a year. Um, not all our land are managed for fire. Or we, we don't do fire suppression on all our lands. 3 million hectares, uh, for people who aren't unfamiliar with hectares, 3 million hectares is about the size of Massachusetts, the state of Massachusetts, so a big chunk of land. And our area burned has doubled since the 70s. And despite fire management agency becoming more effective and more area being covered by fire management activities. And, you know, as you'll find out, I'm quite biased in terms of the role of weather. And I believe that this is because our weather has been changing, the climate's been changing, and it's more conducive to fire now than it used to be. And that could be a subject of another webinar about climate change and fire in Canada or Western United States or Alaska. But many of our fires are fires that involve the crowns of the trees, uh, that's called crown fires, high intensity fires, very difficult for fire management agencies to control once the fire involves, engages the crowns. Um, in terms of fire size, 3% of our fires are larger than 200 hectares. A hectare is about twice the size of a football field or soccer pitch. And, but these 3% of fires are responsible for 97% of the area burned. And I think for the American West, I think a lot of people are familiar with this concept. I think about 1% of your fires burn 99% of the area. It's about 3% in Canada burn 97% of the area burn. And so the tail does wag the dog in terms of fire size statistics. And many of these large fires occur on a relatively small numbers, small number of high fire weather severity, hot, dry, windy, we call it. So here's a picture map of Canada. And you can see that uh, you know, fires are shown by color by decade. And there's a broad swath going from Quebec on the east through northwestern Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Northwest Territories, Yukon, and some into BC. So this great swath of fire from sea to sea to sea. Um, and that's really fits the arboreal forest. So Alberta is a bit different than many jurisdictions. In Canada, it, the landowner is responsible for fire management. So the provinces are responsible, territories, parks are responsible for their fire management. And in Alberta, we can get fires any month of the year. And we've had fires this year in February that had to be actioned uh, when we had a Chinook event. But our primary fire season is from April to September. Officially, our fire season now starts March 1st because our fire seasons have been starting earlier. But about 44% of the area burn occurs in May. And we're the only jurisdiction in Canada that has May as the most you know, the month that has the most area burned. That is our busiest month. Um, and these May fires are, you know, generally human caused. About 82% are caused by people. And that's because our lightning season doesn't usually kick in until late May or June. So, you know, most of these fires are preventable. In Alberta, it's a 10-year running average, about 1,500 fires and 200,000 hectares. Uh, 2015 was a busy year, burned almost 500,000, and 2016 was even busier with over 600,000 coming from, you know, about 600,000 from one fire alone, the Fort McMurray fire. Now, the reason for the May fires it, and the, the difference of Alberta with other jurisdictions is pretty well all across Canada and many st places in the states as well, we have a spring burning window after our snow melts for regions that have snow, but after many parts of Canada have snow during the winter. Once the snow melts and before things green up, there's a window of opportunity for fire. And if you get hot, dry, windy conditions and ignition, away we go. And Alberta has a lot of grass, more than other jurisdictions. Um, also, Alberta has a lot of activity in the woods. Um, we're the quad capital of the world, four-wheeled vehicle Quad, we call them quads, and these can start wildfires. So that, and we also are 
predisposed to having very strong, dry southeast winds because of a synoptic weather situation that often occurs in spring, and it's most dramatic and pronounced in Alberta. So those are the reasons why Alberta is a bit different. Um, in Canada, we spend on average about $800 million a year. This has been increasing, um, and it's going to continue to increase as there seems to be more fire in the landscape. Um, of course, we spend this money because health and safety of Canadians are important. Uh, we have lots of evacuations, impacts on economic activity, like we saw in the Fort McMurray fire. There's smoke impacts on health, and transportation, air and ground, and also fire affects water quality and quantity, and we're seeing more and more of that in our, some of our recent fire episodes in Canada and the United States. So fire, in many respects, is like real estate, location, location, location. So if the Fort McMurray fire had started 100 kilometers to the east, I wouldn't be talking to you right now because it would have been burning in the bush. And there might have been one article about smoke in a city or two, but we wouldn't be talking about it, okay? So, but the fact that the fire started so close to town that it was able to spread into town, here we are. So globally, there's been lots of fire of note, Australia, Black Saturday fires, and then 2003, Russian 2010, the United States pretty well every year now, uh, Quebec 2013, Sweden, BC, Northwest Territories 2014, Alaska had quite a fire season in 2015, that's been parts of, of uh, Canada, and of course Slave Lake 2011, and Fort Murray 2016. There's publication from a few years ago that showed that Globally, smoke-related fatalities are pegged at 330,000 per year. Most of these are in Southeast Asia with a haze issue from those, a lot of those peat fires. So here's my, if you forget most of my talk, this is kind of like my take-home message, my philosophy. And here I'm talking about fire on the landscape, not an individual fire. I'm talking about fires in northern Alberta over a week or a month. But these are the ingredients necessary to have fire. Whether there's people in the landscape or not, there's been fire in the landscape as long as these things are around. Fuel, what type of fuel, how much fuel, how is it structured, the chemical composition. Um, you need these. And there's a picture in the top left picture of the boreal forest in northern Alberta, lots of fuel. The boreal forest is generally not fuel limited unless there's been a recent fire and then, you know, as things grow in, then it's ready to burn again. Ignition, uh, natural, is lightning, but there are people, humans. Uh, weather, temperature, precipitation, there's synoptic patterns that are important, solar radiation is important. Uh, we often call it hot, dry, windy. I think weather is the most important because it does influence the other two. Fuel moisture, which is critical for fires starting and spreading, is a function of the weather. Lightning is a function of the weather. So weather is really important. And uh, the bottom right-hand picture is a picture from the Northwest Territories, and there's a fire burning in peat. So um, fires can burn deep underground. We have peat, organic layers. Uh, sometimes sphagnum moss, 40 centimeters or more in depth, and it can smolder for weeks, months, and even over winter and start up in the following spring. So briefly, some of the listeners may not be familiar with the boreal forest. It's a northern forest. It's circumboreal, circumboreal circumpolar, whatever you want to use it. It encircles the globe. So it goes across Canada, Alaska, into Siberia and Scandinavia. It's often called a conifer forest. There are deciduous trees or broadleaf trees in there, spruce, pine, larch, fir, cedar. Um, conifers are very flammable, uh, with the exception of larch, which loses its needles every year. There's a few broadleaf species, aspen, birch, um, and these are not as flammable as the conifers. Um, it's a northern forest, so 
means a short growing season, and that generally means a short fire season because other than the smoldering fires, we don't have fire problems during the winter. So a little bit about ecology in the boreal. So, you know, it's a large, largely a stand renewing, a stand replacing crown fire. So it removes competition, allows sunlight to reach the forest floor, reduces, removes the organic layer, which is, makes a great seed bed for many conifer species, the mineral soil. Standard succession models don't apply to much of the boreal, rather what you see is what you get, and if there's some people who used to word, use word perfect, you'll understand what that, what, where that came from. So, you know, if you have a, a stand of jack pine, you get a fire, you get another stand of jack pine, because they have serotonous cones. That is, the seeds are sealed in a waxy resin, and it needs heat to open that cone, and fire is the provider of that heat and opens the cones. Um, some use other strategies like suckering, uh, Aspen's a good example of that. So there's, the boreal is used to fire. It survives and thrives in a regime of semi-regular stand renewing, stand replacing high intensity fire. So that's what goes on. In Canada, we use something called the Canadian Forest Fire Danger Rating System. And that has the fire weather index system, which is based only on the weather. And then we have something called a fire behavior prediction system, FBP, which is based on fuels. And there's 16 common fuel types. And I'm not going through them all, but I just wanted to show you an example of one of the most common types, what we call C2, conifer number two, and it's boreal spruce. And you can see from that picture that, you know, there's fuels, ladder fuels, all the branches go from right from the top of the tree down to the ground. So it's easy for a surface fire to spread up into the crowns of the trees and burn. Now, in terms of mixed woods and deciduous, um, boreal mixed wood, leafless. So in spring, before things leaf out, this is what you see. Around Fort Murray, I'm not going to delve too much into the fields, but there's a lot of aspens and there's a lot of conifers. Now, because of the aspen, I would consider Fort McMurray a medium risk community. There are many more communities at much higher risk because they're surrounded by conifers. And some people have called aspen forest asbestos forest. I would not go that far, and we see what happened in Fort McMurray. I definitely would never say it's an asbestos forest. I think that's completely erroneous. But the aspen around Fort McMurray had an understory of spruce. And so it was almost like an understory crown fire. Um, and we'll see some pictures coming up. So with fire comes lots of evacuations. And here's just some work done by Jen Beverly and others that shows evacuations from C to C to C with structures lost. And this is work done by a former student of mine, uh, Lynn Johnston. And this shows the traditional wildland urban interface, as well as what we call the wildland industrial interface, the WE, as well as the infrastructure interface. In particular attention to, um, yeah, if you see Alberta, it's the second province. I'm, going to, I'm not going to draw. I'm going to try and use this pointer if I can drag it. Here's Alberta. And you can see there's lots of development. There's some areas where there's not much development, but that's a national park. It's called Wood Buffalo National Park. But you see there's lots of development. So it means there's lots of people on the landscape working, living, playing, recreating. So lots of development in the province of Alberta. So fire management, um, I would suggest that uh, Canadian fire managements are among the best in the world. As I mentioned, we use the Canadian Forest Fire Danger Rating System. And it's akin to your national fire danger rating system used in the states. Our system is more empirical based on prescribed fires and wildfires. American system is more theoretical. But similar in principles, uh, we have different fuels, uh, moistures representing different time lags. Um, 
buying fuels two thirds of a day, duff, you know, twelve to fifteen days, and deeper about fifty days. Yep. Uh, so that's you know, your fifty day ones not too far from your thousand hour fuels. But similar philosophy, initial attack, you hit it hard, you hit it fast. When it's small, it's easy to put out. If it gets to the size of a football field and the fuels are dry, it's hot, dry, and windy, you have a problem, okay? Traditionally, our fire management agencies were complete suppression. Now many have moved to you know, what some call monitor and manage, appropriate response, where they treat fires with a triage system, much like the emergency room at your local hospital. Instead of patients, their fires, a fire arrives. If it's close to community, you know, full attack, full suppression activities. If it's in the back 40 in the bush, fire growth models are run with the present, you know, forecast for the next 10 to 15 days. If it's not spreading towards values, they will continue to monitor that fire daily, but allow it to take a more natural course. And as we've seen from the fire ecology, fire is part of the natural system in the boreal. So trying to let Mother Nature take, you know, take its course is, is starting to take hold in Canada. So just the one slide here, just by the numbers, uh, ignition, this is 2016. Uh, it was detected around 1600 for an afternoon. It was record-breaking heat, hot, dry, windy. About 90,000 people were evacuated. About 2,800 structures were burned, 590,000 hectares. That's about the size of Delaware. So it's a, a large fire. Shareable losses, 3.77 billion. It's the costliest natural disaster in Canadian history, and it may be um, the costliest glo wildfire globally in recent years. And the numbers may continue to rise. Unsured losses, people peg it close to 10 billion, um, but that may still change. And our national GDP was negatively impacted by these fires. So where is Fort McMurray, just in case everyone doesn't know? So, so Fort McMurray is in kind of northeastern Alberta, and California is down here. We're up here. And here's a Google image map. And it's kind of a long corridor along the, that's the highway I was talking about, north-south major highway. And there's lots of rivers around. This is the Athabasca River, and that fire, the Fort McMurray fire jumped the Athabasca River probably about three times, and it runs 800 meters to a kilometer in width. But there's a whole bunch of other rivers, the Horse River, Hanging Stone, Clearwater. There's a lot of topography in here that uh, is hard to see. But you can see there's lots of forests around here, and here's the community, and farther up is the bitumen extraction goes on in this area. So here's a map. And so it shows where the fire started. Um, it's number nine, but there was a number of other fires around the community, and this actually plays a major role because when this fire was discovered and actioned, this fire up, up in this area was also going, and some resources were shipped to that fire because it was so close to structures. This is about, uh, yeah, I didn't have my pointer, sorry, uh, MWF-9 is the Horse River fire, the one that spread into town. It's about seven kilometers from town. MMMD-404, it's a municipal district fire. That's close to structures, and that's where resources were diverted. So here's a picture from an aircraft, and here's the fire that eventually spread into Fort McMurray. And here's one of the ones that I was talking about in the bottom right-hand corner, just getting going, and uh, where they had to divert resources to. And here, and you can see, you know, right in the middle of your screen, the major highway that runs through town, the Athabasca River, and uh, there's a fair bit of topography here. So here's a map showing the community. Uh, so 
detailed 1603. It was actually detected. It was in a grassy area. The fire investigation should be released soon. It was determined to be human cause. Um, there are four-wheel vehicle trails along these power transmission lines, so that might be one possible, but at this point, all we know is that it's human cause. So there's the picture, and you can see the polygon. These are preliminary polygons or fire perimeters. Um, and the ravine river close to the fire, if I can get this going where this is the Horse River, and that, that's the name, the Horse River Fire, but most people know it by the Fort McMurray Fire. So a few minutes, 5.30, 17.30, fire is spreading, crosses over, 18.41, and it's continuing to grow and grow. Here's 1853, 19.30, and here's 11 o'clock at night. We're over a thousand, we're over a thousand hectares, and uh, this is the May 2nd now, and the winds were from the southeast, and that's why it's spreading away from community. So this is uh, the Monday, and tomorrow, May 3rd, is the day that the fire reaches town, because the wind does shift, and the fire continues to grow. And here is the day that the evacuation was called, and the community was evacuated, and you see that it's jumped across the Athabasca River, and somewhere the jumps, we call it spotting, was 800 meters to 1.1 kilometers. Um, there's some details on our fire weather index system. I'll talk a bit about that in a few minutes. And it's, it's growing, obvious concern with the evacuations, but there's dramatic growth to come. May 4th in the afternoon, there's a cold front that comes through. So in advance of that cold front, the winds were from the southwest, so the fire was spreading towards the northeast. But with the cold front, the wind shifted to a west, west-northwest, and which caused a rapid spread. And you can see that on May 5th, it ran almost 30 kilometers in that ballpark. And uh, you can see the final perimeter, which actually goes into Saskatchewan. Um, where it was contained at June 13th at just under 590,000 hectares. Um, so it was a very significant fire. Um, and one interesting aspect of this fire is that it generated pyrocumulonimbus, pyrocbs for short, on a couple of days. And these pyro-CBs, or fire-generated thunderstorms, generated lightning, which isn't unheard of. It's happened a number of times. But this is the first case where I've heard that these lightning strikes actually ignited new forest fires. And uh, so that was, that was the first that I've ever heard of a pyro-CB starting new fires. I've heard of thunder and hail and rain and lightning, but never new fire starts. Here's a... Uh, a map of DNBR burn severity provided by Jin Kai Zhang from Alberta Agriculture and Forestry. And you can see there's a fair bit of it's a high severity. Um, there are parts where there's low and unburned islands. Um, this was early May, and there was the ground may have still been frozen in some locations. So it's uh, it's, it's a modeled pattern, but that's not completely unusual with large fires because you have this burnt over a month. You had days of rapid growth, but you had some days with light winds and low growth or at nighttime. So this is pretty typical of our large fires. So here's some shots. Um, and you see the guy in the motorcycle. Um, it's off to the left, there's flames, the, uh, the conifers you know, are crowning, and it's getting hotter. It's, you can feel the heat, the, the cyclist, motorcyclist, is staying in line, but after a while it gets so hot he just takes off because it's getting 
too dangerous. And away we go, and evacuating the community. So here's a, just a few shots of some neighborhoods, and uh, you know, completely gone. There are other areas where it's more uh, salt and pepper, but many of the communities affected were, many of the neighborhoods affected were like this. It looked like a tornado went through. And, you know, it's just, everything's gone. I mentioned a lot of topography, and you can see, it's, it's hard to see here. This is a stand of aspen, and, but there was understory of black spruce, um, but most of them are gone. You can see a few of them down the hill a bit. Um, so that are around. And it burned quite hot. Uh, boulders were cracked. And you can see how white the ash is. Um, and when the wind was perpendicular to the slope, you get that impact of slope and wind. It was more intense as opposed to when it was uh, going up the slope and angle. But a lot of topography are here, but a lot of aspen. And so a lot of people thought Fort Murray was a fairly safe community with respect to fire or medium or lower risk because of all the aspen. But this understory of black spruce, which is very flammable. So walking around, you see this, these puddles of metal. This is aluminum from the aluminum rims, and there's aluminum in blocks of engines now. So it was a really hot fire because this, this car wasn't really close to a, a structure. It was just a very intense fire. So um, I'm a weather person, and so briefly I'm going to go through some of the weather, the antecedent conditions. It was El Nino. In this part of the world, El Nino, you can go to the bank. It's going to be warm and dry, and that's exactly what happened. Our winter was warm. It was much less snow than normal, so the fuels were really dry. Um, we had record-breaking heat, over 30 Celsius, um, translating on the hottest days, it was above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which is record-breaking heat for this location at this time of year. Uh, we'll talk about the soft surface weather, uh, briefly talk about FWI, look at some upper air maps. Vertical structure played a major role in this fire, and we've kind of touched on the pyro CB already. So these are the temperatures um, for the days. May 1st with ignition, May 3rd was the day that it spread into the community, and then the major cold front went through, and you can see the May 5th, the high was, these are degrees Celsius, 18 degrees, so dropping from the upper 80s down into the 60s. It was dry by our standards, and uh, wind directions, notice on May 3rd, got up to 72 kilometers per hour, um, 69 kilometers per hour on May 4th, so it's hot, dry, and windy. Now our system, our FWI system, some of you may not be aware of it, but one simple rule is if you s subtract the FFMC from 101, that gives you the fuel moisture of the fuels, the fine fuels. So if you have a 96, you subtract that from 101, you get 5% fuel moisture. Um, that, that simple rule only works at higher FFMCs. So and that turned out to be the 100th percentile. That's a record-breaking FFMC for this location. So it was bone dry. When you walk through the forest and hear the, the crunch, 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 that's exactly what was, what was happening here. It was bone dry. It was hot, dry, and windy. Everything was ready to burn. So here's the upper air situation. And it's just showing, the animation is just showing the breakdown of the upper ridge. And Alberta's outlined in red there. And we've seen studies for many years by a number of people that have shown the breakdown of the upper ridge. The upper ridge is just a stationary ridge. It means it's, if it lasts seven to 10 days, it's generally warm and dry, so it allows the fuels to dry out. And then when it breaks down, you get a wind event. And if you have the ignition, you know, away we go. So that's exactly what happened in the situation. Uh, the upper ridge shifted to the east. Here's the upper air soundings. Um, the line on the right is temperature. The line on the left is dew point. And it shows you there, Matt, this is first thing in the morning for location north of Fort McMurray. Um, 
and it shows you the wind speeds and the temperature profile, which is, can be very informative to fighting fire and for forecasters. And I won't go into much depth because of time, but here's the one in the afternoon. You can see it's kind of um, unstable in the lowest atmosphere, and it's approaching 30 degrees, and this was even higher in Fort Smith, or Fort McMurray, pardon me. So here's the vertical profile of wind speed, and if you recall that the maximum gust in Fort McMurray was 72 kilometers, and that's almost exactly what the wind speed was, very close to the ground. Um, this is a low-level jet, and as daytime heating or the fire column can help mix down those stronger winds to the surface, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, synoptic situation, cold front approaching, pass through, um, and on many large escape fires in Canada, and I think probably for the United States as well, cold fronts can play a major role as they bring a wind shift with them. And in the Fort McMurray fire, the southwest wind became more of a northwest wind, so the flank of the fire started to become the head of the fire. Pyrocumulus nimbus, pyro CBs, extreme erratic fire behavior, rapid fire spread, lightning, and the new fire starts I already talked about. So I'm just going to show you some uh, viewers' images, and the first one is to show you where you where we're going to be looking at the junction of those rivers there. That's Fort McMurray. And we're going to just zoom in and watch the fire grow. Uh, satellites are great tools, remote sensing. And you can see where on the perimeter it's hot and where it's not as it spreads through. And the, the date's on the bomb there. And the cold front's going through, and it's going to make a big jump there as the fire grew with that, the flank becoming the head and with the stronger winds. So there's lots of development going on in Alberta. Um, you know, people work, live. And this is showing population and assessment. And you can see, well, hopefully I will drag this over, that you can see Fort McMurray's in this quadrant here in this region. Lots of development, population growth with all the bitumen extraction that's going on in this part of the world. So there's lots of people there, okay? And the little clip from LA Times from last year, 10 years, 6% of the new homes in the US have been built on lands adjacent to fire prone public lands. Um, you know, we continue to build in fire prone lands. I'm not sure if we've learned this lesson yet. So what do we do? Okay, so if you remember the three ingredients, weather, we can't really do anything about weather. Ignition, we can't do anything about lightning. Um, human caused fires, absolutely there are things we can do. Um, and fire, ma fire management agencies do a lot of these things well already. Education, prevention programs, fire bans, restricted fire zones, I would, and forest closures. I think forest closures, you know, if enforced work really well, I think something that I think we should use even more often, especially on those relatively few days of extreme fire weather like we saw here. If things, that the forest was shut down, you know, no people, no fires. So another aspect is fuel. And in the United States, you have a fire wise program. In Canada, we, we have a fire Smart program, very similar in principles, uh, how to protect your home and communities, reduce the risk of fire. You can't eliminate the risk, but we can reduce the risk. Um, Canada, we have something called the Canadian Wildland Fire Strategy, and it, it's about 10 years old. There was an update given. I think there's more we can do because fire management, land management is changing so quickly. And just fire smart build back better, resilient communities, and there's uh, Fire Smart Canada, there's a website, lots of good information, FireWise in the States, also lots of great information. So I'm going to wrap up because it's about that time. Forest fires are a fact of life in our forests, and it looks like they'll be more likely in the future. People work, live, play, recreate in the forest. Also, 
there will continue to be more people in the forest as development continues and spreads farther north. And fire and people will intersect. And we'll get disastrous results for society like we saw in Fort Murray. And Fort Murray was a medium risk. It's the most populated center in our boreal forest. But there are many hundreds of communities in the boreal forest. We have options to reduce the risk and minimize impacts, but we have to learn to live with fires. Now there's two pictures here, and I'm not sure if, I took this one in Fort Murray in May, and it's smoldering. And this is above the waterways community within the Fort Murray community. I could look up down the valley, and there was about 20, 30, 40 of these little hot spots. But maybe hard to see in the foreground, there's aspen coming up already, all right? It's, there's the root stock has survived, and here's a different stand taken in September, but it was an aspen stand that burned at high intensity, and these are waist high uh, in September already. So it's, it's fairly resilient. Um, whether the community is resilient, that's a study for social science folks. So last slide, just thanking some of my funders and uh, supporters, the Alberta government, Canadian Forest Service, Alberta Innovates, I'm part of the Western Partnership. There's my Twitter account and my websites, and there's a picture of Pyro QB from Northwest Territories taken by Dennis Quintilio. Um, thank you, and uh, I guess we can move to questions. Okay, great. We do have a few questions uh, coming in. Feel free to add those in the chat box there, and we'll go through them one at a time. Um, the first one is, I'm going to put it here on the screen for you to see. Um, we are adopting fire adaptive strategies, and I know this person's from the U.S. Is Canada doing the same? I think you might have mentioned a little bit about this, but maybe go in more into depth about what's going on in Canada. Okay, so the Fire Smart program is like your FireWise program, and there is money primarily for fuel management around communities. And a lot of that means removing highly flammable fuels or replacing them with less flammable fuels or isolating the fuels. It's the fire wise principles and the fire smart pr principles are very much the same. They're, they're, they're singing from the same song sheet. So yes, and there's been money put aside um, well before the Fort McMurray fire on fire smarting communities. Um, there's a limited amount of funds, and in some jurisdictions, communities have to apply for the funding, but BC, Alberta, and other jurisdictions for many years now has been treating fuels. But during extreme conditions, even when you treat fuels, you know, it can be problematic because in the boreal, our fuels promote spotting, uh, burning embers, and Perhaps you saw some of the videos from Fort McMurray of the rain of burning embers falling. Well, in the right conditions, the wind can blow these up to two kilometers away. And for example, the Slave Lake fire in 2011, the head of the fire was two kilometers away from town, but yet spot fires were already occurring in town. So the cost of treating conifers within two kilometers of every community, especially if there's a smaller community, is not practical, okay? So there's there's limits to what can be done. And the spotting issue is serious. You know, the Athabasca River, you'd think would be a pretty good fire break being about a kilometer, but it crossed it almost at ease, okay? So there are challenges and we can do things and we are doing things, but when, you know, we kind of protect communities for the 95th percentile. But if you get the 99th percentile in terms of weather and fuel, you know, there's only so much we can do. Um, uh, the next question. question is, oh yeah, was there any, were, were there also some issues with insect damage in the forest trees adding to the fuel load? And it looks like we have a conversation going on in the chat box from people who are around there, um, but what are your thoughts? Yes, there was damage. Uh, um, oh, uh, spruce budworm. Um, maybe I should look at the, the your, your listeners may actually know more about this, but some of the fuels, I'm a weather guy, okay? Fuels are important, but weather, yeah, anyway. Uh, yes, some of the forests, some of the trees were damaged by insects. 
and this probably made the fire more intense, more severe than it otherwise would have been. If we clean up insect-affected trees and forest stands close to communities, this would be one way of reducing the risk. So it depends on what stage the damage is at and what the insect, you know, which particular insect it was. But yes, um, it did play a role in this fire. All right, the next one is a bit of a, a subjective question, perhaps, but do you think the Canadian Forest Service is prepared for this type of size and of a multi-emergency? Okay, so the Canadian Forest Service is actually a research organization. They have no operational responsibilities. So in the case of the Fort McMurray fire, um, there's a strangeness about Alberta. Fort McMurray is over 80,000 people, but it's not called a city, okay? It's, it's some re tax reasons, but the municipal district of Wood Buffalo is responsible for fire within the community, and outside the community, it's Alberta Agriculture and Forestry, the provincial organization, which is a fire management organization. And yes, I believe Alberta is prepared to handle emergencies like this. And the fact that there was no direct fatalities, you know, is an indication that, you know, close to 90,000 people got out of there without loss of life, um, which is amazing given the harrowing escapes that we saw in video. Uh, are they good? Are they fortunate? I think a bit of both. But, you know, it could have been like a Black Saturday situation very easily where with hundreds of people dying. So yes, they are able. Can there, are there areas of improvement? Absolutely. And I think this is what the fire review, which is coming out shortly, is going to address. Uh, because coordination between the municipality and the province, I think, could have been better. And I, I expect that's one of the recommendations. But yes, they, they did handle it, and they were prepared for it. So yeah, OK. And do you know if there was any structure-to-structure -structure fire spread? Yes, there was. Um, once it was in town, the municipal fire department, um, you know, were going around putting things out. And where they had to pull back, they had to pull back because it was too dangerous. Other areas, they did use bulldozers or heavy equipment to remove fuels to save other structures. But there was some building-to-building uh, fire spread. And then the next one, do you know, is there a publication that uh, is presenting the Canadian Fire Danger Rating System? So uh, I'm not sure if this question is about the Canadian Fire Danger Rating System in general. And there's lots of publications um, by Van Wagner, B1, and the Fire Danger Group is another. Uh, 87, 93, respectively. Numbers specific to this fire publication, uh, the review that's coming out shortly should have that information. Um, this PowerPoint has a little bit of information on that. Uh, there's been some publication by the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction in Toronto on structure loss by Alan Westhaver. And there may be some in there. Um, so, but stay tuned. There, there will be more and more publications coming out. But, you know, our system said it was extremely dry, and that's exactly what it was, and hot, dry weather, and, you know, that's the fire we had. So I'm going to use that as a little bit of a segue. We'll get back to the questions in just a second. But uh, you will notice that at the bottom of your screen, there's a couple web links. And the first one there is to Dr. Flanagan's web page, where his contact information is. Um, so if we don't get to your question in time, I think it's, you know, feel free to follow up with myself or with him, and we can see if we can uh, connect you with the information you need. Uh, the event webinar page is the next link there, so that's where we'll be posting the PowerPoint presentation of this and any other follow-up information. If you registered with us, um, I, I will also be sending an email with that information. 
Um, I also wanted to point out that our next WUI webinar is uh, the first day of June, and that's where we're going to have a, someone from years of insurance background come and talk to us about going to FireWise and beyond. Um, lots of good information about how insurance companies uh, look at fire and deal with issues, so different perspective that we've had in the past. And then you'll also see there's a webinar evaluation link, which will pop up in your window after you exit this. Um, and it's really short. It helps me to know um, how the webinar went and if we can make improvements, and even what we can talk about in the future. So it makes uh, my job a lot easier, and hopefully our webinar is a lot better. And then finally, to stay in contact, you can sign up for the California Fire Science Consortium newsletter, um, which comes out once a month and talks about all the webinars coming up, other events, and other publications. So that's my little minute spiel there. We'll get back to questions here. Um, the next question is, what additional weather forecasting and weather situation tools, or WX, would help? OK, that's a good question. Um, the models were pretty good, um, actually. I was at the work a workshop a week before the Fort McMurray fire, and I was looking at the European model, and it had you know, a massive ridge over northern Alberta, and it was suggesting it was going to break down. So all the clues were there that if you had ignition, look out. We already knew it was, it was very dry and record-breaking heat. Now, I, I mentioned the topography, and so more on you know, actual firefighting, using a Wind Ninja type tool, I think would have been really helpful with some of the more complex topography that was around this community. Um, and, you know, but a lot of the tools we had are easily available and were there, and they, they seemed to work. So um, if we could have just stop the ignition, we would have been fine. Um, the weather forecast was, was good. To what degree should or can we rely on forecasting of extreme weather for evacuations? Uh, in other words, is in this case, evacuating prior to the forecast, cold prior to that forecasted cold front moving through, is that is that something we should? Okay. Um, yes, this is an interesting question because it costs a lot of money to evacuate, especially a community the size of of Fort McMurray as well as some of the industrial operations that go on north of town. There are a significant amount of employees and camps north of town. Um, and if you shut down those operations, drop in national GDP. So it's not something you want to take lightly. But what I would suggest where ex forecasting the extreme weather could be very useful is for forest closures. If we see extreme fire weather, let's shut down the forest. Yes, there's an economic cost, and yes, means people can't use the campgrounds and industrial operations are shut down. But it's only generally for a few days before the situation changes. And that's where I think extreme weather forecasting would be useful. Um, in terms of evacuation, once the fire is up, fire growth models like Farsight, we have Prometheus in Canada, but similar types of models, and there's a whole bunch of them. Use the fire growth models and start making those decisions, you know, you know like Australia, leave early if you can. So uh, that would support evacuation, at least a stage. Evac and there was stage evacuations earlier than the May 3rd. Some neighborhoods were evacuated on May 1st and 2nd. Um, So it sounds like that is kind of the next question is kind of touching on that as well. Uh, maybe if you want to add anything or if you feel like you answered the question, I, you know, I think the idea of closing forest is something we haven't heard or considered based on weather. So that's a really interesting idea. But um, is there are there any decision support tools used in Canada to aid in the decision to evacuate an area maybe beyond the weather? Absolutely. There's, uh, there's the duty officer's role is to de decide where resources go. There's fire occurrence prediction models. There's the Canadian Forest Fire Danger Energy System that tells you the state of the fuels and the state of the, the weather with, with that FWI system. If a fire were to start, how would it behave with our fuel types? And these are used in a spatial fashion. Spatial Fire Management System, SFMS, is used by many people. So yes, there's lots of tools to aid. The evacuation decision becomes more complicated because it becomes much more political. And this is starting to move 
in, to an area where I have limited knowledge and perhaps it's best for me not to move too far away from areas that I actually know. Question nine, the fire severity map typical of historic fires? In other words, if it wasn't for the negative impacts to people, would this have been an ecologically appropriate fire? Yes and no, okay? And the reason I say yes is large fires occur in the boreal. There was one in 1950s that was over a million hectares, two million hectares, the Chinchaga fire. There was one in the Northwest Territories in 2014, over a million hectares. And there was one in 2011, not too far from this fire, that was about 600,000 hectares as well. So large fires do occur in the boreal. Yes, absolutely. But this was in spring, and typically early spring, and when there's no lightning. So it's not, it's kind of outside the natural envelope of when fires occur from a seasonal perspective. It's because it's human caused, it did start, you know, beginning of May, whereas if it was lightning caused, it would be later. But that's the impact of humans on the landscape. Um, so ecologically, but it survived, okay? Um, you saw some of the pictures of Aspen returning. So the forest will be okay. I think it's gonna take a lot longer for the community to recover from this. So question 10, could pre-planning for this event participation in fire We'll try to squeeze in the one last question here before, go ahead. Perhaps. Okay, so yes, uh, pre-planning could help. Um, I mean, they were on high alert, uh, the fire management agency, because it was hot, windy, and dry, and the fuels were dry, fire-wise. It so is new. Excuse me? Excuse me, Stacy. Okay, fire-wise landscape. It's fire smart in Canada. Yes, it could have helped. Um, there was some fire smart treatment in some areas around the community, but it's a large community with you know over 80,000 people. Yes, it could have helped. Um, okay. I think we might be having some technical issues, but that's all right, because we are coming, we are just at the close of our hour here. So, um, Mike, if you can still hear me, we want to thank you so much for joining us. Again, if you registered with us, you'll be receiving an email from me in the next week here or so with all the information and follow-up pieces. Um, and so with that, thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks again to our speaker, and have a great Thursday. Thanks, Stacey.